Hello, I'm Rodney Schreiner with Science is Fun in the Lab of Shakashiri and the McPherson Eye Research Institute at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I'd like to show you a picture. This is a print, a silkscreen, made by the artist Brian Besch. It is composed of over 10,000 squares of various shades of gray-green. As you look at this picture, you may be asking yourself, what am I supposed to see? This is a question your brain asks every time you look at anything. What am I supposed to see? The brain is so very good at answering this question quickly that you are not even aware that the question is being asked. However, with this picture, your brain can't answer the question quickly. It takes time, and you might even become aware of some of its attempts. Do you see a landscape? Is there a vase of flowers? Suppose I told you that the title of the work was Portrait of the Artist's Mother. Can you find a face? You might be able to do that because the human brain is finely tuned to finding faces. Here's an example. This picture is made up of squares too, and we can instantly find a face. We might even recognize the face. Faces are the most important things humans ever look at, so we are very good at seeing them. But in the art print, it might not be so easy to find the face, or the flowers, or the landscape. It is hard because the artist decided to color each square by flipping a coin. The pattern is random. Whatever you see in this image is something your brain is putting there. Whatever you see, the artist did not intend for you to see it. Now I want to show you a photograph, and I'd like you to notice how quickly it is that your brain finds objects in this picture. That seemed instantaneous, didn't it? You were not even aware this time that your brain was asking the question, what am I supposed to see? You knew the answer even before you knew there was a question. There are six objects, and you know how they are arranged in space. Why was your brain so fast here? Because this picture contains clues that your brain uses to identify objects and space. These clues include colors, shadows, and reflections. Neuroscientists and psychologists have identified two processes that occur simultaneously in our brains that contribute to our visual perception. One process is a primitive process that we share with all other mammals. This process occurs in the primitive part of the brain which lies at the base of the brain. This process is called the bottom-up process and it detects individual objects and locates them in space. This process is one that your dog or cat also uses to identify objects. Your dog or cat, when looking at the scene depicted in the photograph, would see, as you do, six objects and would see them in their relative positions, front to back, left to right. The second process uses information that we have acquired through experience and have stored in our memories. This process occurs in the more advanced part of the brain, which is above the primitive part. This process is called the top-down process. Your dog and cat also have top-down processes, but a human's is much more extensive and powerful. For example, in the photograph, there are two objects that you know are related, but which your dog or cat would not know. Your experience tells you that the black disc in the foreground is probably the lid for the jar on the left. Your experience also tells you that the object at the back is a clock, a device that can wake you up in the morning. Your experience also tells you that the blue at the left is probably from a blue liquid in the cylinder. However, the object to the right of the clock is probably unknown to you. You haven't seen anything like it before, so your top-down process draws a blank even though the bottom-up process detects it as a separate object. The top-down process uses your memory to identify and recognize objects around you. It can also stir up emotions that are tied to the memory. For example, if you're a person who hates to get out of bed in the morning, the alarm clock can elicit feelings of sadness or maybe disappointment. If blue is your favorite color, you may find the blue liquid to uplift your spirits. Artists have learned how to use techniques that assist your bottom-up process to identify objects and locate them in space. 
Here is a painting in which the artist Chuck Bauer has done just that. By the use of color and shading and perspective, he makes it easy for your bottom-up process to detect objects in space. Your top-down process may recognize these objects as beats. If the magenta color is one you like, you may find this painting particularly appealing. If you happen not to like the flavor of beets, your reaction to the painting may not be as positive. The artist can compel your bottom-up process to see objects in space. Everyone's bottom-up process works the same way. However, the artist cannot compel your top-down process to recognize beets or to like them. That depends on your prior experience and memory. Now I'd like to illustrate something of a puzzle in the way artists can use a technique to create images in which we recognize objects. In the photograph, there are no lines around the objects. It does not look like a page from a coloring book. The 19th century French realist painter declared that there are no lines in nature. Nevertheless, we humans can draw pictures using only lines and we recognize objects in the line drawings. Here's an example of a line drawing. Immediately, you recognize a face. In spite of the fact that there is no shading or color and the fact that there are no lines in nature, you recognize a human face. When you look at an actual face, you don't see anything like this collection of lines, yet in this drawing, you see a face. How can we recognize objects in a line drawing when there are no lines in nature? Actually, our bottom-up process deals with lines all the time, we just are not aware of the lines. The lines that the brain uses come from the retinas of our eyes. Each human retina contains over 100 million light-sensitive cells. Before the retina sends information to the brain, the information is processed to simplify it. Where there are boundaries between colors, the retina sends information about the boundaries to the brain. Here's a painting by the artist Judith Mianis. It has distinct boundaries between colors. When you look at this painting, your retinas send to the brain information about the boundaries between colors as well as the colors themselves. The brain uses boundary information, lines, to detect objects, but the brain does not show the lines to us because they really aren't there. The bottom-up process uses the lines in line drawings the same way it uses boundary information produced by the retina. However, in a line drawing, the lines actually are there and the brain shows them to us. Now I want to show you some more pictures. These will be images of abstract art. Abstract art contains an image that does not represent any objects in the physical world. Yet abstract art is composed of the same elements that realist artists use to produce images that represent objects in the real world. When you look at a work of abstract art, both your bottom-up and top-down processes are working simultaneously. The bottom-up is trying to identify objects, and the top-down process is trying to make connections with your memory, experience, and emotions. Here is another line drawing by Trent Miller. This is complex enough that the bottom-up process spends time trying to find objects in it. You may feel yourself trying to do this. You may find something in the image. However, it is an abstract. It does not represent any particular object. The more complex an abstract image, the more time and effort the bottom-up process will spend on it. The top-down process is working too, but with little input from the bottom-up process, it does not make many connections to memory. Here is an abstract painting by Pamela Callahan. This image is also complex. There are many clear boundaries between colors, so the bottom-up process may work at finding objects. The colors in the image are also bright. Colors have potential to affect the top-down process. Many people find bright colors, such as those in this image, to be attractive, even uplifting. Here is a painting by Sandra Peterson. It has strong lines for the bottom-up process to work on. The colors are more subdued than those in the previous painting, so the top-down process may engage in emotions differently. The painting may elicit emotions that are less exciting, 
more somber. In this painting by Rick Ross, the colors are bright, but the lines are indistinct. There is less for the bottom up to work on, and the objects are hard to find. Nevertheless, the bright, warm colors can evoke from the top-down process a brighter, more exciting feeling. Let's look again at a painting we looked at earlier. The image here is very simple. There are only a few strong boundaries that give the bottom-up process very little to work with, and so it quickly gives up. That leaves only the top-down process reacting only to colors and shapes that don't represent objects. It recalls no distinct memories, only subtle emotions. This suggests why many people find the paintings by the American abstract artist Mark Rothko to be so emotionally powerful. Here is his painting, Black in Deep Red, from 1957. There are no strong lines for the bottom-up process to work on, so it falls silent. All that remains active is the top-down process. This process makes connections to emotions. Rothko's paintings make stronger connections to the emotions than to any other part of experience. This may be why many people experience a deep emotional state when they view Rothko's paintings. One reason that many people like abstract art, perhaps, is because through abstract art, they can experience their own bottom-up and top-down brain processes. While looking at abstract art, they can feel themselves and their brains trying to answer the question, what am I supposed to see?